Yes, it's time again, you know, for a little update on the support in GCC and the GNU toolchain in general of the weird uh, compilation target ever conceived, at least in my opinion. Um, well, the summary, I will just make, you know, a very little uh, summary of this because we don't have uh, much time. Um, well, BPF, for in case anyone doesn't know what it is, uh, BPF is a sort of a, a, a virtual architecture which is supported in the Linux kernel. And it originally was intended to be used to for filtering packets, like net, network packets. Like when you get a network packet, you decide if you want to let that packet go or not so uh, for that apparently it is good to have a lot of flexibility uh, so basically they designed you know like a sort of an instruction set of um, in a virtual machine in the kernel that in which you can write your programs to decide uh, given a packet uh, to, to accept it or not that was originally then that evolved into a sort of a kitchen sink you know, in the kernel, and more and more kernel subsystems are starting starting to use BPF, uh, hooked, hooking BPF programs in many different places. Um, uh, so well, um, originally only LLVM was able to compile C programs to BPF. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we decided to add support in the GNU toolchain as well. Uh, so we introduced this port BPF and non uh, which is now upstream and available for everyone uh, who is uh, lucky enough to work with BPF. So um, in this talk, basically, I will present now in, in one minute some general updates. Then uh, David Faust will talk about the support for BTF, which is a debugging format associated with BPF, as Indu has already introduced in the previous talk. And um, the support for something called core, which is which means uh, compile once uh, run everywhere. David will tell you in detail what it is and how painful what was it to, to implement it. Um, and also, well, some additional uh, options in the compiler, like new command line options to support, you know, a sort of a version levels of the BPF instruction set. We will see that as well. And then finally, Guillermo will talk about the support for a few new instructions that the kernel chaps have added to the kernel uh, to support atomic operations. So the port itself um, is it's completed. I mean, we have a full binutils uh, support, you know, assembler, disassembler, also linker, even though the linker is not used, but um, it is supported. Uh, we have a full-fledged GCC backend um, that can compile C uh, into BPF. We have uh, GDB support as well. So GDB knows about the BPF uh, uh, virtual architecture and you must be able to use GDB to debug your BPF programs. Associated to that, uh, there is a BPF simulator, which is part of GCC, uh, or sorry, of GDB. So, in theory, at least, you can actually uh, run your BPF programs in the simulator and debug them like a single step in, you know, and breakpointing them with UDB. And, well, we have also a, a, a board description in the Jacknu, you know, for, for the test suite. And uh, some miscellaneous updates here. Very fast, we added uh, um, a couple of new instructions to something that we call XBPF or Extended BPF. Um, in particular, we added support for uh, signed division and signed modulus instructions that BPF does not support, but we use them so it, 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 so it makes it much easier for us to debug uh, the GCC backend, basically. Um, we changed the GCC BPF backend, uh, so now it can emit DORF, the back info. We will see later uh, that the main debug information for B for BPF is BTF, but nothing prevents us to generate DORF as well. Um, the DORF that we are generating, that GCC generates for BPF, is not that terribly useful in some senses because uh, this target is very, very particular and there are things that we, we cannot express, right? In particular, you know, call frame information and stuff like that. Anyway, but it's there, you can generate DORF. 
for UBPF programs. Um, we had to make to make several adjustments and and fixes in the compiler to pacify the kernel verifier because the BPF programs that you compile with you, you meet with the compiler then you have to run them in the kernel but in the kernel there is something called the BPF verifier that looks into the BPF programs that you are uploading and decides if those programs are safe to be executed or not now the verifier is very anal I mean is 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 it's a pain in the ass basically but okay it has to be there um, so it's not always easy to generate the right code for the program to be able to be running the kernel. Many bug fixes and functionality wise, and I am very happy to uh, that I can say this. Finally, after a lot of work, we can tell that we are on par with LLVM in terms of functionality. So now there is no more excuses for anyone to use LLVM to build BPF programs for the kernel. I mean, you can do with a very a small, a slim uh, BPF unknown and GCC executable, which is at most 12 megabytes big. Uh, what you will be doing before with like what, like eight or nine or 10 gigabytes of LLVM runtime. Okay. So this was all I had to say about uh, the general uh, update about the project. So now I will let Guillermo, uh, David to, to talk about uh, BP, BTF core and the new instruction level support. David? No? Yeah, there you go. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is basically what we've already seen thanks to Indu, which is the BTF support that's now in GCC. Um, this is just the BPF type format, and it conveys type information as well as general debug information for the kernel to load BPF programs and make use of. Um, one thing that's interesting about the implementation in GCC is that it's supported for any target via the GBTF flag. And that means that, well, most of the time you wouldn't find much use for BTF information if you're not the BPF backend. You can actually do things like, say, generate BTF information for the kernel directly when you're compiling for x86 or AR64 or whatever your kernel is, rather than the traditional method, which has been to generate all the dwarf and then convert that into BTF for the BPF loader to use. Now, naturally, BPF is tailored to BPF programs. So if you want something similar but more general purpose, then that's what CTF is for, basically. Um, so with that in mind, we can tackle some of the problems that BPF has had, which first of all is portability. And the issue here is that BPF programs are loaded into the kernel, and they're going to interact with kernel data structures, which means in order to do something useful, they have to know definitions of those data structures. And this isn't limited to just user space APIs, but they can also be internal kernel headers. And the thing about those is they change a lot, even between subsequent versions of kernels. And that means that if the data structure definitions are changing all the time, and you compile your BPF program against headers in one kernel version, in general, you can't expect it to just work when you move it over to another kernel. And so traditionally, the solution to this has been to carry around a compiler between kernels and recompile your program from C into BPF on every particular version of kernel that you want to run on. But luckily, there is a solution, and it's already been um, implemented and designed courtesy of the kernel and LLVM hackers, and it exists already in the LLVM BPF backend. And that's this thing that Jose mentioned called BPF core, or compile once, run everywhere. Um, this is basically just relocations for accesses to kernel data structures. And of course, in order to be able to have any information about those data structures, we needed the BTF debug with the type information. But now that that's available, we can finally implement this and give the kernel a way to know what instructions does it need to adjust at load time of the BPF program and how to adjust them from whatever data structures the program knew about at compile time to those that are actually present on this kernel. And the way it works is pretty similar to most relocations that you would be familiar with. So say, for example, we have these two versions of the same structure definition, one for kernel A and one for kernel B, and kernel B has added a new field into the inner struct. Well, if we compile this program on kernel A, 
it only knows about this old definition. And if we go to load that into kernel B, it won't know what to do without core. So we generate this down here, this thing referred to as a core relocation. And this basically re records the information that you would expect. It says, what instruction do I need to patch? What is the type information for the containing structure? Some form of an encoding of what field am I actually accessing in that struct? Because if the fields have changed something, the BPF loader in this case, wants to figure out how can I adjust these accesses to try to find the field that is the same field on this new version of the struct. And taking all this together, the BPF loader then has the information it needs to load a BPF program, take the BTF type information that's in there, process all of the core relocations, compare them against the BTF that is available for the kernel that it is loading the program on, and figure out how to patch the instructions accordingly. And once you do that for all the instructions that need relocation, now your program is suddenly portable from kernel A to kernel B without having to recompile it. And that is really nice for a lot of reasons. So that all of that is now implemented in GCC. Um, it's all contained into the BPF backend. So if you're any other backend, you don't have to worry about this strange form of relocations that aren't really relocations that are responsible, that are the uh, BPF loader's responsibility to figure out. Um, but of course, we needed the type information. And now that we have BTF, we can do that. But there is one thing here that I want to touch on a little bit, which is there's some unfortunate coupling with the .BTF information. So the core relocations go in a new section called btf.ext. But this information here that records what field of the structure are we accessing is actually encoded into a string. And that string is stored in the regular .BTF section string table. And this means that any time we want to generate these relocations, we actually have to delay output of the debug until after we can generate all of those relocations, which turns out to be pretty late in the compilation process. Um, and oh, of course, the option that controls all of this stuff is this minus M core option. Um, by default, if you're generating BTF information for a BPF program, the core information will be done for you. You don't need to manually specify the option. It's implied because it's part of the debug information. So what the implementation actually provides is two things. First of all, there's a built-in. And this built-in is called preserve access index that's specific to the BPF backend. And the name here is chosen to be compatible with the same thing in LLVM. So the way it usually looks is something like this, where you'll have some information that you want to access, and you'll wrap the reference to that information in a call to the built-in. But it's a little bit weird because this built-in doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't change the semantics of the program. It's purely a transparent marker that tells the compiler, hey, I need to know information about this access here so that I can generate the core relocation information so that the program can be adjusted at load time by whatever kernel we're loading it on. And it accepts any type of expression, and it just returns the result of the expression in here. And if you have many accesses to structs that you need to record this information for, you can do that with something like a statement expression, which you might have seen in the kernel if you're familiar with this stuff. But this gets pretty ugly pretty quickly. So there's a better way to do that, which is the attribute version. And this is basically the same thing as the built-in, but it says for any type that's attributed with this, and it applies to structs and unions, I care about every access to this. This whole struct might change between kernel versions, and I want you, the compiler, to automatically generate the relocation information for me so that I don't have to manually wrap every single access in a call to the built-in. And so this makes it a lot more convenient to work with, and that way, we're able to generate all of the information that we need to support this compile once run everywhere mechanism that is the same that LLVM has. Um, and it's a pretty cool thing because now you don't have to carry around compilers, you don't have to worry, and suddenly BPF programs are actually portable when you compile them on one machine and trans try to transfer them to another kernel. Um, so that's basically it for core. Moving on to something pretty different, but also related is specifying what features of BPF does the kernel that you're trying to run a program on actually support. 
And this is something that until now we haven't had a good way to specify in GCC. And that is over time, as new things have been added to BPF, sometimes you could be in a case where you're generating code that is targeting a more recent version of BPF than the kernel that you're trying to load it onto actually implements. And these are things that have been added a long time ago. There was no support for uh, comparing branch operations with a less than, it was only greater than or equal to. Um, and over time, there have been support for new 32-bit ALU operations and 32-bit jump operations, which just treat are the same as the 64-bit versions, which are the default, but they treat the operands as 32 bits rather than 64. And most recently, the significant addition has been new atomic instructions that are supported in BPF, which Guillermo is going to talk about next. But now we have new options available, and these are just basically what you would expect feature options that enable or disable, there's a negative version of these, those options to say, hey, my kernel has this or doesn't have this, so please don't generate code that would be incompatible. Um, and this all sort of culminates in a MCPU specification that says, what sort of stable version of the BPF ISA am I targeting? Um, and so the options here are basically the same ones that are sort of standard with the BPF hackers, which is a version one, which is the very first one, version two, which adds the additional compare and branch operations, version three, which adds the 32-bit the versions of ALU and jump instructions. And if you don't specify this all this at all, then we just default to the latest, which is currently a synonym for version three. Um, and this becomes convenient if you have some custom version of a kernel that you know implements almost everything that's in version three, but maybe it doesn't have 32-bit jump operations for some reason, then you can combine them and just disable those operations. And with that, I will hand it off to Guillermo so we can learn about the BPF atomics. Guillermo? Uh, meanwhile, uh, while Guillermo comes up, uh, Tony had a question. I propose we wait until the end uh, to have questions depending on time that we have left. Uh, but maybe if you could just stick around, uh, David, after yeah, the presentation. Certainly. I, um, I can't get the chat to load, so if someone could relay that question, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think the chat is, uh, is uh, malfunctioning because they're creating accounts. That's what uh, I, I read. So I will do okay. it by video, and if we can, then we'll use one of the hack rooms. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Guillermo, take it away. <clears throat> okay, thank you, David. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, we will talk about, about the implementation for the atomics instruction in the near to change. And as we know, the BPF program was designed to be executed in a kernel space. And the kernel code is executed in the asynchronous way, in, in some cases, in preempting behavior. In other main cases, as a parallel execution. And of course, the BPF program are not the exception. The same code can be executed on behalf of two different process, or more than one thread can be executed the BPF code with the same data in the same process. Therefore, the data, the data could be shared with other part of the system, and concurrent problems can be arise. Then the BPF developers have found themselves need to implement some manage some strategies to 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 handle the concurrency issues. So synchronization mechanism are implemented in the BPF code. One of them is the spin lock. The spin lock helps to protect data that it's handled in a block of stemming of the code by using the kernel function BPF spin lock and BPF spin unlock. <clears throat> it promotes the reentrancy pattern to gain fine granularity to handle such critical section. But another uh, second alternative that we have to manage such concurrency issues is the atomic instructions. Instead of protect data in a block of, of code that is focusing to synchronize the access in a single piece of data in the critical section. <clears throat> the support in the kernel was introduced in, the, in late, uh, at late 2020, along with the documentation describing the fields, bits, instruction, and much more used to encode in the code such kind of instructions. <clears throat> So the instructions supported by the kernel and scribing in such documentation are add and or exclusive or exchange and compare and exchange. It's important to mention here that one comment was, was written by designer and maintainer of atomic instruction in the Linux kernel. And that mentioned that they are using the immediate field of instruction to extend the opcode for the atomic 
the, for the atomic construction. <clears throat> and it is showing this the following picture. As you can see, and the design of the instruction, they are using the operand field of the instruction as the as an opcode field. This introduced some complication because the content of an operand field is indexed dependent. As you can see here in this picture, the bit 32 to 39 is the immediate field, but now the, the opcode is split in, in two different bytes. Uh, show it in the screen screen squares. Our porting is based on the CGM framework that is used in being used to generate the opcode structure for a particular target, trying to warranty that the CGM is able to generate the right structure for the new EBPF optometric encoding. A couple of limitations in that framework was found. The first one <clears throat> is that it wasn't able to provide the support to compute the mask for getting the correct values for constant fields. This constant field are used for the atomics, atomics of code of code. And the second issue found is that we already fix uh, we already fix to correct the calculation in the mask and value when the field is defined in a long form instead on a short form and the offset is different to zero. Next, as after add the CGN support, now we were able to describe in a natural way the atomics instruction in the CPU description file for the EBPF target. So basically, we are we add uh, DNA of the five normal instruction in the in that in the listed in the documentation in the machine description file for the EBPF target, and also the definition. Some definition were added to be run on the simulator, but since the architecture in the bit in the bin issue sorry uh, since some some other architecture relies on the bin utils uh, on the bin utils and the CGM framework uh, the previous patch is modifying some core stuff so uh, careful and internal revision was done and a complete regression test was required to warranty that no side effects were introduced for the for this architecture for the EBPF architecture in the other ones. Mm -hmm. This table shows that the syntax is used, the syntax that is used by new assembler for atomics encoding. As I already mentioned, there are two different encoding for atomics of code show in the in the last column. Because the opcode value is Indian is dependent. <clears throat> And finally, this is an example of the disassembly atomics operation, atomics instruction using the Linux tool chain. We have adding support also for the GCC for uh, for atomics building functions. This implementation is fully compliant with the GCC building function provided by those buildings that generates the atomic instructions. To bring the GCC support, basically we add some definitions for the atomic instruction in the BPF MD file that it's the backend for the EBPF target, as I show in this in this example. For instance, adding the support for the add atomic instruction, EBPF add atomic instructions. Since the atomic instruction are using implicit destination and operands registers. <coughs> that in, in, in EBPF always is the R0, a new constraint was added in the backend to make sure that the, the register is used in, for the BPF instructions. In that case, it, this example shows the compare and, and exchange atomic instruction for the EBPF target. And finally, we have a, a, an example running point-to-point -point from the C code, C source code to the to get the, the object file to be installed or, or loaded by the, by the kernel verifier and run the eBPF program. And that's it. Thank you, Guillermo. Uh, thank you, Jose and David as well.
so if I remember correctly, it was Tony who had a question. Hey, sorry, hunting for the new button. Uh, um, yeah, I was curious as to um, the how the references are done for the relocations. I mean, how, how, you know, it looked like an example you had. It was it was some numbers. So if it's like the fifth declaration, then what happens if there's been declarations put above it? And then obviously the question: Well, what if the semantics have changed? You know, how's that kind of captured? For the core relocations, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in BPF, the way that instructions are referred to in both the loader and the verifier and things like that is they're always referred to by an offset from the beginning of the section. So that way you know what instruction you're looking at. And for the declarations, at when you're compiling the program, you have to know exactly what that type is that you're referring to, right? So you have a definition of the struct and you have all the type information for it that's in the BTF section. So to refer to a particular field in that struct, um, there's the string encoding, which was shown briefly, but basically that's a zero based index for the position of the field that you're accessing in that struct and it nests. So the, the colons that are in that syntax separate layers of the field. So uh, maybe we could go back to that slide actually and see. But I mean, is the first number which declaration? I mean, what what if some? I mean, if it's maybe it was the fifth one, and now in the new kernel it's the tenth one. D does that mean you're now right, referring right, to right, the right. wrong one? So the key is that the BPF loader at load time it has type information for both the program that you're loading and the kernel that you're loading it onto, and so it uses that core relocation to figure out as much as it can about the fields in the struct that the program accesses. And then it has some way internally to figure out how to match those up to the kernel versions. And it's possible that it doesn't know, it doesn't have enough information to do so and will fail. So it's trying to like do name, like here's a name yes. that's roughly yeah, the same. So because Maybe you added a V3 on the end, but it must probably mean the same as that V21 over there kind of thing. Right. Exactly. So because the indexes are encoded in the string accessor, it can look up all of the detail about the struct members in the type information because the BTF information has stuff like what is the member called, what is its base type, all the things like that. And so it can match them up. And then dealing with semantic changes, that's just, you know, by a beware. I had a field and it meant this. Yeah, yeah and that's sure. The that's, same that's, name field that has different semantics and just you're just right. out. Okay. It's not a perfect solution, but it's it's better than not having one. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? I guess maybe I could have another another one. <laughs> um, I mean, what's your assessment? I mean, as far as I can tell. BPF is really giving a lot that Dwarf does. So how does one compare and contrast these two ways of thinking about things? I mean, is one better than the other? Are they serving different needs? Or, you know, in some future world, could there be a unification of it or et cetera? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's not entirely clear to me either, to be honest. But the key, I think, is that the BTF information and all of the extended stuff, like the core relocations and everything, are very much designed by the needs of the kernel. And so everything that goes into them is from a kernel perspective. What's the information that we need? What would be useful to have? And how do we pack that into a debug format that can be added into these programs? And I think the key problem with Dwarf is probably just that it would be too big and complicated for the kernel to want to figure out at the time where it's loading a program. But maybe Jose can add more. Um, well, I mean, uh, Dorf in comparison, BTF is compact. It's much like CTF. Actually, they, they share the same ancestor, right? 
And when when it comes that you are interested in, uh, I don't know, you know, information about some C types, um, how big is the DORF information for a complete build kernel nowadays? I don't know, gigabytes? Maybe huge, right? And uh, right now the kernel people, what they do is that they build the kernel, they generate the DORF for the kernel, and then there is a component in the kernel, of which I think the maintainer is here in this talk, actually, I think. Um, translates the DORF of the kernel into uh, the BTF for the kernel. And I think that the translation is just a megabyte speak, right? For the BTF information for the complete kernel. But presumably DORF doesn't want to deliberately be big. So, I mean, you know, no, no. if BTF has solved I, the problem of making it smaller, then why wouldn't DORF want that benefit too? Yeah, right. This is not a criticism against yeah. DORF. This is well, I guess my bigger question really was just there seem to be these two ways of thinking about doing this. I'm just trying to like comprehend, you know, is there something that is the best of both or, or you know, or is one just point blank better than, you know, more capable than the other? I mean, if you look at the Infinity project, I mean, they, they were moving towards you know, trying to have a way of describing more of this stuff. And I, I think one of the folks working on it was looking at BTF as a way of kind of achieving that. And, you know, it, rather than using there are, and I, I just, it just seems like the goals are very similar to me. Mm, yeah, but that's one of the reasons why we took that much pain in introducing support for CTF and BTF in GCC. Um, and not just for the BPF target, for every target. I mean, there are domains, there are applications where DORF is either too complicated to interpret or too inconvenient or too big, right? So for those situations, a simpler format um, may be better. So do you see things that DORF does that BTF can't do? And that's why it still makes sense to, you know, be thinking of it. Mm, things that Dorf does and BTF doesn't. I think the other way around. Uh, yeah. well. You were mentioning, uh, Jose, at the beginning of the presentation that uh, uh, for BPF, you are capable of generating Dwarf, Dwarf debugging yes. information. And then yeah. you said that uh, it's actually not very useful because Dwarf wasn't really well tailored for what BPF needed to do. So maybe that's a clue. No, 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 no. Those limitations come from the fact that uh, the BPF architecture is very peculiar. Mm -hmm. And um, so, for example, the stack is disjoint. So, um, and this all comes from security um, uh, security aspects in the in the kernel. Like, for example, when you call to a sub program in BPF, you can pass a pointer, an absolute pointer that points to some location in this of the stack of the caller to the colleague. But, and that's legal. You can refer to that pointer in the colleague, but you cannot uh, actually access the stack frame of the caller using a relative offset, to, uh, you know, using the stack frame as a negative or sorry, a positive, that would be a positive, right? A positive um, offset, right? Because the stack is disjoint. And if you try to do something like that, the verifier will complain and not load the program. So with that kind of limitations, it's so difficult to generate uh, call frame information for indoors, right? For BPF programs, for example, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. So that's what I meant. And But it, the limitations, they don't come from the fact that DORF is limited or anything. It comes from the fact that the BPF arch virtual architecture is very, very restrictive. Uh, we're about five minutes over time. So uh, we could uh, continue those discussions in the hack room if you guys are interested, uh, or if all the questions have been answered. We could stop here. I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm very interested to learn more. I, I, you know, if if anybody were interested, <laughs> be cool. Well, and uh, for CTF, which is very similar to BTF, also in domain, um, maybe you will find it interesting to join the discussions in the CTF uh, STD.org mailing list. <laughs>
Okay, th th thanks, Josie. We need dwarf uh, experts there. <laughs> I don't know that that's me, but I just like, yeah. No, I, 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 I just, yeah, I'm just trying to like just comprehend how these two things kind of relate to each other. Just, to, yeah. I mean, it just seems like some of the things that you, you kind of tackling there seem things like, as I kind of look forward in dwarf, just seems like they're similar things. And if, you know, if there already are solutions, then you know, yay, kind of thing. Well, I'll, all, all I can say is that while I don't, um, I mean, keep in mind that here in with the support of, in the toolchain of BPF and associated technologies, um, the technologies we are implemented are basically given, right? I mean, uh, the main use of BPF is the kernel, obviously, and it makes full sense that it is the kernel hackers who are evolving, right? The technology, the instruction set, the how it works, right, and so on. And but in this particular point, I totally agree with them that uh, probably Dorf is not the best. Uh, you know, I mean, something like BTF or even CTF is it, and it works. I mean, this core uh, mechanism is very impressive. The fact that it actually works, it works, and uh, and it works well. So 